So I want to call the meeting to order at 7.30 p.m. Uh, present tonight in person, myself, Mr. Dunn, Ms. Muth, Mr. Uboa, Ms. Curtin, uh, Ms. Taylor will be a little late and probably join us virtually. And then virtually we have Ms. Skamersky, Mr. Mann, and Ms. Massey. So eight board members here tonight, this evening. All right, so thank you. Welcome to our April 14th board meeting. We will have a budget presentation as well as our regular business. And with that, please uh, rise and join with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, everyone. So to kick off the start of our meeting, we have our student council reps here uh, from Columbia. I see Ryan. Hey, Ryan. And Katie, your little tiny picture in the bottom corner of my screen. So, uh, but I can see you. So who would like to start? Um, I will start tonight. All right. So since we just got back from break we and are moving into quarter four, we're just kind of in the planning stage for a couple of our events. And um, we had a meeting after school today to talk over those. So right now we're considering having a Mother's Day flower sale in the beginning of May, uh, along with our food drive for the backpack program. And hopefully um, we're trying to figure out some sort of fun outdoor activity for our members to do since it's starting to warm up now. And I will hand it off to Ryan for the rest. Hello. Uh, we are also starting to prepare for student council elections, uh, which will happen towards the end of the year. And we are also starting to plan the Columbian Awards Ceremony and are beginning to consult with the administration to figure out what our options are and whether we can do it in person or if it will be virtual. Very good. Thanks, Katie and Ryan. Any, uh, any other comments? You guys have a good break? Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So in the home stretch, right? Yeah. All right. Any questions for, uh, for Katie or Ryan? All right. Well, thanks. You're welcome to stay in the meeting if you'd like. But uh, if you need to do homework, go ahead. We'll, we'll <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll now move to the uh, public forum. As we have with virtual meetings, we have an email set up for the public and the community to email uh, comments to. Residents, students, employees, and business representatives of the East Greenwood Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. Members of the board do not directly respond to assistant concerns during the public forum. If a response is appropriate, either president or superintendent will contact the indiv individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name and address or affiliation with the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon free speech protections, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum is not deemed to be an open forum. The board president will conduct the forum for the orderly and efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which, which may be considered defamatory or stigmatizing or prohibited will be declared out of order. So with that, um, like I said, we have the email. We do have two presentations coming up and we do have another opportunity for the public to comment later in the meeting. Um, but I will now turn to Linda to see if there's any email communication. There are no public comments. No public comments time. this time? Okay. So I know there is a, um, a long-awaited uh, conversation to happen around reopening. The guidance came out from the State Department of Health uh, just Friday when we're on break. And I will turn it over to our superintendent to give a report on the guidance, and then the second portion will be a budget presentation, and then we'll welcome board comments. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Simons. Thank you, Mr. Buno. Uh, we want to make sure that the public is aware of the changes in the New York State Department of Health interim guidance for K-12 schools. We recall that uh, over the course of the last couple of meetings, we have been talking about the constraints of the current, the prior guidance, which indicated that our students needed to be socially distanced in classrooms and other areas of the school six feet apart uh, through our advocacy work, both within our advocacy committee and also in Quest Arboses, we contacted state officials once the CDC had issued new guidance to encourage the state to adopt and incorporate the CDC guidance, which permits school districts under 
certain circumstances and with certain considerations to move from six feet of social distancing to three. Uh, we were hoping that that guidance would come prior to the spring break, so logistically over the spring break, some of the preparations and planning could occur, but we didn't wait until that guidance came. We did a lot of work in planning and logistics prior to the spring break, including having some faculty and staff meetings to make the faculty and the staff within our district aware that if these changes were to occur and that the state were to issue this guidance, we would be moving in the direction of bringing more children in for five days of in-person learning and implement where we could the three feet social distancing requirement. So as Mr. Buno had indicated, the guidance came from the state on Friday, the last real day of our break. Uh, on that evening and throughout the weekend, myself and others began to review the guidance. And when we got back to school on Monday and Tuesday, respectively, we began to revisit our planning. Uh, I'm very encouraged by some of the opportunities that we will be able to implement under the new guidance. Uh, there are still some issues that remain unresolved. Uh, we are uh, targeting the implementation date for bringing all of our children back uh, to be April 26th, which is a week from Monday. Uh, at this point, there is a high level of confidence, I have a high level of confidence, that we will be able to at least bring all of our kindergarten and fifth grade children whose families would like them to participate five days a week in by that date. We are still working on middle school and high school. One of our obligations under the new regulations is to meet with parents, community members, and staff, and all of our stakeholders. So as we make these changes, I've also scheduled for Monday evening uh, a community meeting that Mr. Adam will probably be putting out tonight during the board meeting so that we'll have the community meeting on Monday and any parents and any other community members that want to participate, that'll be at 6.30. We will have an additional faculty and staff meeting now that we know what the regulations say and we have a pretty good idea of how we would implement. We'll have those on Tuesday and we have a board meeting on Tuesday, and I hope to be able to have a written, revi revised reopening plan to present to the board on Tuesday evening and uh, answer any questions of the board, and hopefully the board would approve those revisions in time for us to do what we need to do between Tuesday and the following Monday to uh, implement. One of the requirements is difficult to implement at the middle school and the high school level, particularly at this time of year. Uh, we are into the fourth quarter, as Katie had indicated. Our student schedules that were developed in the fall provided students with an opportunity to take elective courses, AP courses, honors level courses, and college credit courses at the high school. At the middle school, we have uh, not only our core courses, English language arts, math, science, and social studies, but we have technology and art and music. And some of those musics are optional, such as chorus and band. And then we have PE. So as was reported on CBS 6 News this morning, particularly for larger districts, and there was an interview with Shenandoah and Lawson Spa, it's difficult to change a master schedule at a middle school and high school without being more disruptive of children and programs than what we're currently able to maintain in the hybrid, but we're still looking at uh, options. The difficulty is that the regulations require that if the community transmission rate is at a certain level within your county, middle school and high school students are required to be cohorted. Now, cohorted is something that has been included within the regulations since September as a recommendation in some cases. Uh, 
as a best practice, so to speak, to mitigate the results of spread of COVID-19. But those risk factors have to be weighed against the educational uh, considerations regarding how you go about structuring your program. So we made a conscious decision that we would offer a full complement of courses. And that was a good decision to make because we have kids that are on track for certain pathways to go to college and to study certain career fields. And without those courses, particularly as you move into your junior in your senior year, that would have been very difficult. But cohorting is required now under the regulations based on the community transmission rate in our county, uh, virtually in every county in New York State with, a, with, I think, two exceptions right now, and almost every area across the country. The transmission rate metric that is used by the CDC, which has been incorporated into the state plan, uh, is more uh, restrictive than what our state currently uses. It involves calculating the uh, number of positive infection cases that occurred over a seven-day period over the $100,000, $100, excuse me, 100,000 people. So uh, it, and if that infection number is high, according to the guidelines, you are placed in a certain zone. Our county is currently under CDC guidelines uh, in um, a high risk zone, which means that uh, we have more than 100 cases per 100,000 residents. Much different and somewhat contradictory to where we see our state using state metrics. Rensselaer County is only at 1.6 percent infection rate, which is a measure of uh, the number of positive cases over the number of tests, not over 100,000 residents over a seven-day period. So we tried to discuss this issue with our county today to get a better indication of how these metrics line up, whether or not there was any ability of the state to implement its own measures. Uh, which would be uh, more uh, permissible for our district to not have to cohort our students at this point in the year. We really did not get a firm answer, uh, and the county indicated that they would uh, be looking at it and discussing it through their statewide uh, organization. After our county meeting today, we had uh, a webinar from the New York State Department of Health that presented the plan. Uh, that webinar, I participated in at Marissa Cannon. Our Director of Human Resources participated in it in many districts in Rensselaer County, including Craig Hansen from the Questar participated in it. And at the end of the presentation, there were questions and answers that had been pre pre previously submitted. And one of the questions was, what is your definition of cohorting? And the definition of cohorting was defined as the um, assignment of students to fixed groups and, the, uh, the, and that those fixed groups of students do not intermingle with other cohorts or other groups of students. And what that means in a practical matter is every student who was taking um, a course schedule at, let's say, our middle school or our high school would have to be in all of his or her classes with the same identical group of students. And that is very difficult to do at the middle school and high school level. You think about kids who, for example, right now have already taken technology, okay, and they're in music, okay, in the way that we do it at the middle school. They would have to repeat a course. You think about situations where kids may not be able to be in an honors class because the honors classes are, uh, are based on students that meet a certain criteria uh, that we believe they would perform well in an honors class, AP courses. So to, to break up that mixed assignment of students right now uh, when kids are almost ready to complete the school year is virtually impossible under the rules 
as established by the New York State Department of Health. However, I indicated earlier that we would be able to uh, do K-5. There are some options that we've discussed today with our middle school administrators and that are still being fine-tuned that may permit us to uh, bring all of our sixth graders in. Okay, and one of the contradictions within the regulations, and I did send an email into the New York State Department of Health uh, email that was established. If we have sixth graders uh, in a middle school, they seem to be being treated differently under these regulations than a district that might have their sixth graders in an elementary setting. Many districts do have K-6 setting. The regulations say cohorting is required based on the transmission rates at the middle school and the high school level. The basis of that is that the infection spread among older children is more prevalent than it is on younger children, but the grade level is not defined. So we'll have a situation where our neighboring districts might have sixth grade in an elementary school. They won't be, they won't be required to cohort their students and completely disrupt their schedules because their sixth graders are identified as elementary students. Ours are in the middle school, and so I've asked for a clarification regarding that from the state. So we have some, we, we have a level of confidence that the K-5 uh, will be successful uh, on the 26th. We are obligated to continue to have discussions with our employee groups regarding that. We have a discussion planned for tomorrow with the teachers union. We are still working on an option that would, uh, would not require cohorting at the sixth grade level, but would also require us to maintain the six foot social distancing. And we think we can do that. It comes with some constraints and some things that I need to flush out a little bit and have some further discussions that relate to uh, employment matters. Uh, and, and we'll continue to look at middle school and high school to see what we can do uh, to, uh, offer more days of in-person learning to our middle school and high school kids and hope that perhaps we're able to get um, either from our county or our state a different uh, translation of the regulations that are currently binding school districts in the area of middle school and high school. But the other thing I want to say is logistically, based on the work that our administrative team has done, our principals, uh, we had a meeting this morning we're ready to go. The only, the only hold up logistically is we have some furniture on order. And I'll explain that in just a bit. That furniture is expected to arrive later this week and next week uh, in time for the deadline. Uh, we need some furniture because uh, the cafeteria need to be set up in ways that maintain six feet social distancing. We cannot permit students under even the new regulations to eat lunch within three feet of one another. It has to be six feet or more. So we have to maintain individual seating for students or spread students out over large tables. We can't have group seating like we typically would in a cafeteria. When we began the year, we moved out of our classrooms, which are uh, individual desks for for example, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade, desks went into the cafeteria to set up the individual seating. We need to maintain that in place right now, but we need individual desks for the intermediate grades, the three, four, and five. So we're doing a number of things. We've borrowed from each other uh, in, our, in our schools, and the high school's been very generous with the one-armed bandit chairs, and we have kids in some elementary schools, not ideal, who will be eating lunch at a one-armed bandit, but we're selling it as you get to be like a big college kid. You get to sit in the, <laughs> in the types, of kid, types of chairs that the college kids sit in. We've, ha we've had to, um, we're going to have to utilize uh, uh, portions of our gyms in some schools, the middle school in particular, and the high school for uh, extra seating for lunch. Uh, part of the uh, good news about this is the timing is right because it's spring and physical education can be uh, offered outside and those spaces are available for alternative uses. Additionally, in some schools, 
um, because of the number of students in a particular grade level and the timing of lunch periods. Uh, there is a need for outdoor dining and uh, some of our students at DPS will enjoy the pleasure of some outdoor dining under a tent. I think that's the second grade. Uh, and in some cases, uh, PE will be outside on inclement weather days at Goth under a tent. So that's what the need for the tent was. That's what the needs for the tent are. So logistically, equipment-wise, we are set to go. Uh, in the areas of middle school and high school, the only challenge we foresee right now is uh, a cohorting requirement. We're going to discuss all of these issues with our employees. We've already just start, started some of those discussions. Uh, we'll present this information on how we're actually setting up the schools to implement the three feet social distancing requirement to our parents and our community and to the board next week. I'm really pleased with all of the efforts that our principals have made to uh, make these plans in a short period of time. And in many cases, staff is being consulted with at the building level uh, and providing us with some very good input on how to, how to implement this new uh, revised guidance. The other thing I would point out is transportation and busing. The guidance isn't much different than what has been in place since the beginning of the year. Uh, we were very conservative in our approach in September having one child per seat and siblings sitting together. Uh, we aren't going to be able to do that uh, with the bringing every ch ch child who wants to, parents want them to be in every day. Uh, we surveyed other districts that are of like size to us and they are doing the best that they can to maintain as much uh, a level of ridership on their buses that is as safe as possible. We have, uh, through Mark Noah's efforts, uh, looked at each bus route and what the numbers would be on each of the buses. It will be over the 22 per bus on the 66 passenger bus. In some cases, we may have to encourage families to bring their children to school, but in some cases that doesn't really help us because, for example, at Red Mill, there are a large number of parents dropping their children off to school already, and we've been fortunate not to have too many problems with the traffic being all the way backed up through Hampton Manor, but we are getting complaints. So um, all of these things are trade-offs, uh, but with the windows open on the buses and the hatches open, the level of ventilation and fresh air uh, is increased. The, we can do that now because it's spring. Everyone is still required to wear a mask. Uh, everyone is required to wear a mask in the school. Uh, we're having discussions about whether or not mask breaks are even permitted now under the new regulations in settings where students are three feet, according to the state today. They are not only for eating. Uh, if the students are sitting um, you know, six feet or more apart, so we're having those discussions, but. Uh, it's a work in progress, but we feel pretty confident that April 26th uh, uh, we will be able to meet um, at least the K-5 coming in five days per week, and it may wind up being K-6 with further work to do on 7 through 12. Okay. Thanks for the summary, Mr. Simons, and uh, the work of the administrators and the, the teams, teachers, everyone's support. Because because we know prior to this we were anticipating this guidance would come out. We did make those adjustments and changes and plans um, in preparation for for guidance, not knowing what it would actually say. But uh, I think all well, the work done and the work done quickly to get things in place. Uh, really glad to hear about um, being able to do that for our students. Um, so and and especially with the middle school, if we can do that with the middle school. Um, having a high schooler, I think they've come kind of adjusted to the hybrid and would probably remain there. But I think the middle school is really important that we uh, try to address as best we can there. So any questions or comments for Mr. Simons, board members? None here. Any out there in virtual? No? So, uh, Jeff, uh, I wanted to thank you, too, and everybody. It's amazing that we'll be getting those elementary school kids back in full time. 
uh, it's a, it's very exciting. Uh, the, the middle school and the high schools, are we still considering bringing them back in on Wednesdays every other? We're, we haven't had that specific discussion yet. Uh, or, I guess can we consider that? Well, is that one of the options? Yeah, we have a, we have some option at this an option at the sixth grade that would be more would be better than that in terms of in person learning, and we're gonna we'll be having some discussions about the virtual Wednesday uh, with our teachers association later this week. So it is still under consideration, but there might be some things that we could do uh, differently than just that every other week option. But it's under discussion, and it's and it's tough because I really feel pretty bad for the seniors. I don't know if we can do something to get them to come in a little bit. But again, I understand we can't with the cohorting as much as we wanted to unless that changes. But um, those guys are really impacted. Um, they were last year as well. So, I, you know, I wish we could do something to let them see each other again for a little bit. We're working on every option we can think of. Uh, I'll, give, <laughs> I'll give an example today. And um, I emailed, I emailed um, Jill Barker after I got off of the New York State Department of Health webinar and I learned how they define cohort because I was hoping we could more broadly interpret that definition and we really can't. Marissa, do you agree? I, mean, I agree with that, Mr. I Simon. asked Marissa to listen attentively to see if there was any <laughs> room there um, and there really isn't. Um, so I emailed Mrs. Barker, the principal of the middle school and I said, can you please work on an option for cohorting, uh, at least at, uh, at sixth grade, to see if that's feasible at the sixth grade. Uh, within minutes, she contacted Stephanie and said, can you meet with our administrative team? Uh, I needed a half an hour to finish my COVID report so I didn't get in trouble with Governor Cuomo. <laughs> and then I um, jumped on a meeting with Jill, Mike, and Sarah. They had already had a couple of plans uh, that they had done prior to the break. And with some fine tuning and some sharing that with the teachers union um, for the sixth grade, I was I was encouraged that um, with that option. And I just want to discuss the particulars with the teachers about it yeah, first. But that, but the idea is we're trying to pursue everything we can within the rules that we have uh, for all grade levels. Uh, and, for all grade you know, levels. in advance, I would I, you know I definitely want to appreciate all the. All the teachers in all the all all the schools, all the administrators for helping to do whatever they can. Um, we know that you're doing the best you can. It's really tough with that cohorting at this point. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else, John? Just a just a comment. Um, throughout all these conversations that we have, um, we do get some feedback from the public that. Has they have a perception that we, we want to keep the kids out of school. And I, I think that we need to periodically state as a group that it, we recognize how important it is to get the kids into school. But unfortunately, we also recognize that we are uh, a government body that's governed by rules and statutes. And just reminding everyone that we're operating within the statute and within the rules that we as a local board cannot control because if we did have the control we would take a, a more uh, decisive action and not constantly waiting for decisions and I just wanted to make that comment that um, the planning and preparation that goes into this is immense and well thought out and uh, I appreciate it on behalf of the community and students, the effort that the administrators and all the, the staff at the district made, but keeping in mind that we are governed by statute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good comment. Thanks, John. And then, you know, one of the things that's frustrating, and you mentioned Mr. Simons, and I listened to the webinar as well, is the, the metrics that they use um, and the indicators, like you said, because there's really two indicators. There's the, the 100 cases per 100,000, but also the localities of your positivity rate. And what they told us on the webinar was, you got to go with the higher of the two. You can't go with the lower. So even though we have this very low percentage in the county, um, when you look at it from the 100 cases per 100,000 persons, it, it jumps to a whole different level. Yeah. And you, you have to use that. They're telling us you have to use that and not the one that they give us every 
every day and it's on the New York State website. So that's unfortunate and uh, maybe that'll shift with some, some uh, communication. So anyone else comments? All right, thank you for that. Mike, I did have a question. Nope. Yes, um, John. And I may have missed it, so I apologize, Mr. Simons, if you said it. You had mentioned that there would be the purchasing of furniture, um, additional um, furniture. Um, when is that anticipated to be delivered? We've already purchased it. Uh, we have okay. some now, and we have some coming on the 20th, but Linda knows the details. I'm going to defer to Linda Wagger on that. Okay. Linda's been great about getting stuff that was necessary, but okay. also forcing people to dig out from their storage rooms and from their pods, anything that we could use. So. Great. great. Thank you, Mr. Simons. Um, we did order uh, some additional thermal scanners for the high school and the middle school. They'll be in by the end of this week. Uh, as Mr. Simons said, we ordered tents. Uh, there are two at DPS and one large one at Goff, and those have been delivered this week. They'll be set up later in the week. We ordered 112 elementary school desks. Uh, those are going to be in next Tuesday, the 20th. And we ordered 56 desks at the middle school level. Those will be in by next Friday. And we ordered 260 three foot by three foot tables, 100 at the high school and 160 for golf. And those will be in by this Friday. I think that covers everything. Great. Thank you very much. And I, I too, just want to thank everybody. Um, as frustrating as it is, is, we'd all like to see the kids back at school. We do know that we have to follow the guidance that we're being given, and it's changing on a daily basis. So I appreciate all the hard work and look forward to the kids, um, as many as we possibly can, back in school um, and working towards getting, hopefully, the, the remainder of, of them back as soon as possible. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. And I just want to note, too, that uh, Ms. Taylor has joined the meeting. Hi, Joanne. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I know you joined late. Good? Okay. All right. If there's no other comments or questions for Mr. Simons, we'll move to the, the second report, which is the 21-22 uh, proposed budget presentation. Thank you, Mr. Buno. Okay. Mr. Goodwin, wherever you like me to stand. Over there. Are you going to need a microphone, Jeff? Okay, just want to make sure. I know you have an elementary voice, so you can, uh, what? You probably need that mic. <laughs> Restaurant voice, sorry. <laughs> so while Mr. Goodwin is pulling up the formal presentation, I just want to begin by uh, really uh, showing a sense of appreciation for um, the New York State Legislature and the governor, really. It's a unique circumstance for me as a superintendent who is often working with a board of education here on advocating or, in some cases, complaining about the fact that we have been ignored in terms of the level of resource that we need from the state. It's a different kind of presentation tonight because our state legislature and our governor have really put schools in a much better position than what we ever could have imagined back in August and September. We really were, uh, our worries were really twofold regarding the students uh, as we began this school year. Uh, the uh, educational impact of COVID-19 on our district's abilities to provide services in the best manner possible for the kids. And we've worked through that this year, and I think we have been successful under the hybrid. But the second worry and concern was that we were going to be doubly hit and doubly punished by very serious economic issues that could lead to re uh, a resulting reduction in state aid this year, 20% or more, which is a lot of money, and even, dig even deeper cuts uh, next year. So fortunately, the New York State uh, economy, uh, in terms of the revenue that the state was able to um, take in uh, when we bounced back through some of the reopening, in combination with federal support at the federal level for schools, our district is in 
a very good position to bring a budget to the community that we hope the community will support that maintains programs that uh, in some cases add services that we know will be needed to provide the academic support for the children as they come back and transition to full uh, full uh, time learning in class, hopefully in the fall. And that uh, we have also received some federal monies that put us in a position to look very carefully at what we can do strategically over the next few years to make sure that we continue to advance learning and growth for our students, but also make sure that we have money set aside for any potential future uh, issues or emergencies. So I want to thank the state for what it did uh, on behalf of public schools uh, to put us in this position, which is a much uh, brighter uh, situation than what we ever could have imagined back in August and September. During the presentation this evening, I want to highlight some of the accomplishments of our district because the budget plan that we put together and put forth to the community on May 18th, that only reflects the expenses and the revenues that we have to uh, ask the community to support in order to provide for our students, but it's also a reflection of values. What are the values of the East Greenboro Central School District? And we value collaboration, we value academic achievement, we value partnerships, and we value the success of our students, our families, and our staff. Additionally, we want to highlight changes that we've made to the budget since May 10th. Mrs. Wagger has done an exceptional job putting together the budget this year, taking the feedback that's been provided both from me and our administrative team, but also from the board, and really taking a close look at what could be done on the expenditure side of the budget to make sure that as we are receiving this extra money, we're also mindful of how we spend it. And I really appreciate the job that Linda has done. Additionally, we have revised our revenue projections now that we had the final state budget that includes the expense-driven aids as well as the uh, foundation aid. We have updated our projected state and federal aid, and we have uh, looked at and we want to present to the community some trends on our budget versus our tax levy versus the aid. And there's a remarkable uh, graphic that we want to show you about how, what a different position we're in this year than what we have been even just last year and the year before. And important dates to be, in, uh, be mindful of in terms of the budget vote and the board election. So we know that the board supports the professional development of our staff, and that has been an important priority. And I will have to say, quite honestly, since Mr. McHugh has absorbed the professional development responsibilities among a number of other responsibilities within the scope of his job as the Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, the level of participation in our professional development and the level of engagement of our staff in those opportunities has increased remarkably. And I thank Mr. McHugh for his leadership. But we've got a new initiative this year, which is going remarkably well in a partnership with UAlbany's Literacy Department, which is world renowned. The University of Albany's education program is a world renowned in the area of literacy. And we have consultants from the UAlbany working with our teachers on best practices to enhance early literacy instruction with a particular focus on struggling readers. And that's something that we are able to do through resources that are provided to the district both balance of federal and state resources. I think we're using some federal resources to fund that program. In terms of accomplishments, uh, we want to brag a little bit about our kids, if that's OK. We want to highlight the fact that we have uh, four, not just one, but four national merit finalists within our district. Sophia Culver, Simon O'Connor, Joseph Vitale, and Clara Jin are finalists for the national merit finalist and that scholarship. And that is not something that comes very lightly. It's not something that is easy to do, uh, but it, and it is a remarkable accomplishment. So we're proud of those students for achieving that. Additionally, during the course of this year, uh, we have honored our special education department. What a great job they did last spring. Our special education teachers, our service providers, our counselors, our social workers, our occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech therapists, Remarkable job they have done, school psychologists supporting our, our, our students. Particularly, it's hard to deliver special education services virtually and remotely, and our teachers have done 
and professionals have done a remarkable job. We boast about our sports teams, uh, and we have, again, under difficult circumstances this year, we've had our boys and girls bowling teams both undefeated and winners of the Suburban Council Championships. So congratulations to our bowling teams as well. Our food services department, what a wonderful job they've done since March, okay? We have an interesting situation right now. We are serving meals when the kids are in school, and we have to serve meals when the kids are not in our schools and make sure that we have access to breakfast and lunch for our kids that might need it. And over the course of this year, the federal government and the state approved free uh, lunch and programs for all students in all districts, regardless of uh, eligibility requirements that have uh, typically been in place. Well, the net effect of that is more kids are getting lunch. Okay, and it's more uh, service required of our, 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 our department under Phyllis <coughs> Sanford Krug, and they do a remarkably good job. Moving to dollars and cents, uh, uh, our budget is a balance of revenues and expenditures. Uh, we gave you some projections on March 24th. Uh, we were projecting on the revenue side of the budget that we, would, uh, we were planning about $96.2 million in revenue. We would appropriate about the level of appropriated fund balance that we have appropriated in, la in the last few years at 6.8 million. Additional state aid has come in at one point, almost 1.2 million. That includes the foundation aid combined with our net effect of our expense driven aid such as BOCES aid and transportation aid. And we're happy to say, and I'll probably say it three or four times, during this presentation, we recognize that COVID-19 has had an impact on the finances and the economics of the region. And we are happy to say that the proposed tax levy increase of 1.28%, which is at the cap, has been eliminated under the budget. And we are adjusting the revenue that we would gain through the tax levy down 752,029. So basically we are not going to raise, we're not proposing that the tax levy be increased next year. We're proposing a 0% tax levy. So that's a subtraction of the $752,000 that we otherwise would have yielded through the 1.28% tax cap. So that brings our revenues to an estimated 103 million point five. On the expense side, since our last meeting, uh, we have made some adjustments. We are, um, we think that we should be able to provide our parents the ability to register their children for school online for a couple of reasons. One, our, our pupil personnel services generally handles that responsibility and people have to come to the high school, they have to check in, they have to walk to the PPS office and they have to register their children. We think it's more convenient for them to be able to do this online. We will still offer in-person registration Additionally, that department has been through transition. There have been, there have been changes in the clerical uh, assignments within that, and we think we want that department to focus more on special education and services to kids. That will, this will not eliminate that responsibility from that office, but it will reduce it by giving our parents the ability to register their children for school online. That's an enhancement of our existing system, PowerSchool, which is our student information system. We've made some additional salary adjustments since the last meeting. We've adjusted some of the salaries associated with the superintendent's office, which is my salary and my secretary's. Those budgeted items were not as in line with the actual um, salaries and costs. And we've looked at our uh, insurance coverages and we are able to adjust the estimate of what those insurance coverages would cost of about $134,000. So, We've continued to look at the expenditure side of the budget and to adjust it to be balanced with the revenues that we project receiving. Here's a summary slide of the revenues that we just reviewed. And again, I would highlight that um, the negative 752,029 is a reduction of the 1.28% tax levy increase down to zero. Uh, since March 10th, Again, March 10th, we presented the budget for the first time. We were proposing a budget of 103,994,286. The board is aware that summer learning uh, and, and addressing the learning gap is a program that we are going to have to have in place to make sure that our students who are 
coming back to school in September are as better, best prepared as possible. Uh, we budgeted within the general fund budget $200,000. We may not spend that. Uh, we are still looking at how those federal resources can be spent. So that may be money that is saved within the general fund budget to either adjust next year, uh, next year's budget. But right now we have kept it in the general fund budget. And on April 14th, we are recommending, which is today, we're recommending the additional online registration program. So on the addition side of this, we've added 242,722 of items, which includes the summer school and the online registration. But we've also reduced, since March 10th, budgeted monies for professional development at 45,000. We've made adjustments to our salary lines based on individuals who are retiring at a higher salary and the replacement cost of somebody who will be coming into the district with uh, a lower on the lower end of the salary scare, scale. We pulled monies for equipment of about $118,000 out of the budget. We've adjusted the salaries for the superintendent's office and we have uh, reviewed our liability and disability insurance. So on the reductions, we've reduced about 701 thousand so uh, around four hundred fifty to four hundred sixty thousand dollars net expense reduction uh, when you take those additions and reductions to the budget so our proposed budget is 103 million five uh, which is about uh, again uh, about four hundred and fifty eight fifty nine thousand dollars less than what we were proposing uh, on March 10th this is a summary of our state aid I would just point out a couple of highlights We've been talking about foundation aid in East Greenbush since I arrived and long before I ever came. And I know that there were big concerns prior to me coming about foundation aid and the gap elimination adjustment. And uh, this is the first time I think that we could say that we're on the right track. Uh, we've gotten a 6% increase in our overall foundation aid. And according to Questar BOCE state aid planning. There are some districts that the legislature and the governor are, have indicated have been underfunded, and East Greenbush is one of those. And there is an effort right now to bring us up to the level of funding under foundation aid that is required by law over the next three years. And so this is perceived as the first step in that process. Whether or not that will be maintained uh, is, is uh, a question. We hope that it will. But it's something we've been asking to be done for many, many years, and our efforts are paying off. We talked about the fact that the governor had proposed in his executive budget a consolidation of all of our expense-driven aids into services aid. Well, that has been eliminated, so we zeroed that out. But those monies uh, are really represented by the BOCES aid, the high ex excess high-cost aid, private excess cost aid, hardware and technology, all of the categories of expense-driven aid transportation that we're used to seeing. And that's important because what we spend this year, we get aided at particular formulas next year, and we want those aid levels to reflect our actual expenses. Um, the services aid proposal was really a cut uh, and not just a consolidation. Our building aid uh, is scheduled to increase slightly. We know we were in the middle of a capital project and we submit our capital project uh, final cost reports to the state, and we yield back approximately 72% in building aid for uh, every dollar that we spend at 72 cents of state money. That comes back to help us to uh, continue to fix and repair our needed issues within our facilities. First time that I'm aware of that districts that were not considered to be high needs districts were provided with a pre-K allocation okay and we have to talk about that uh, in a, hopefully in a future meeting um, pre-k monies of 583,200 have been provided to the district that does not necessarily have to be spent by September uh, we are going to work within our administrative team to bring some ideas for pre-k to the board uh, for consideration we have talked about buying for competitive grants in the past but we're unsuccessful because we didn't meet the needs criteria but now um, universal pre-K seems to be truly universal and that districts are actually going to get the money who may not be uh, necessarily targeted districts because of the socioeconomic indicators. And we have projected higher excess cost aid 
flowing into the district because of the services that we are getting through um, BOCES to file for um, state monies that we are eligible for for certain types of services, particularly for our students with special education needs, speech therapy, physical therapy, other types of services that kids receive are eligible for um, uh, reimbursement from the state. Outside of our general fund budget that we're proposing tonight, we are also receiving federal revenues. And we are still reviewing with other districts, with Questar and with the state, how these monies are permitted to be spent and the best way to make sure that we use these resources in ways that put our students in the best position possible to be successful, but don't put our district in a position that when these monies are gone, we have a lot of recurring expenses. So the worst thing we could do as a district is to rush into spending these monies. We want to be careful about it. And we don't want to incur a lot of long-term obligations. How can we best get our bang for our buck? This is $7 million in federal money that we're getting through the CARES Act, which was approved in December, and the new American Rescue Plan funds. We've started conversations about how we might be able to work regionally on some of the issues that I know are a concern of the board, such as mental health. Had a very good meeting today with Commissioner Kathy Kuhn of Rensselaer County Mental Health, uh, Dr. Cruz, and some of our neighboring districts about how we might pool resources to be able to provide, and that was encouraged by Mr. Buno. <laughs> Mr. Buno sent me an article from another area of the state and said maybe we ought to talk about working with the county on some of these mental health services because of the sustainability concerns. And I did have that meeting and it <laughs> went really well today and we have some ideas that uh, we're putting together. So these are federal funds. These monies cannot be used to plug into the district's budget and, and reduce taxes. They have to be used for the specific purposes that are outlined within the legislation. Those purposes in general are address learning gaps in students that have been caused by COVID-19, COVID-related expenses that would enable the district to remain fully open uh, and offer in-person learning K through 12, uh, summer programs, mental health, uh, all of the things that we're worried about. We've been given federal resources to address it, but we wanna do it cautiously. There are also some ways that we could use these resources strategically to offset future expenses that may come about and maybe setting aside some monies for things that would help us uh, down the road. We're just starting to have the conversation, so we really don't have any specific plans at this point. Um, in terms of trends, uh, we've, we've shared this graph before, but we added an additional line. The budget changes that have occurred over the last five years are reflected by the blue line. So we monitor how much is our bu overall budget increasing. And we saw last year, for example, that our budget increased 4%. This year, through some of the expenditure reductions that we've made and some of the adjustments we've made, we've been more conservative and we've reduced our budget increase from this year to next year to three projected 3.77%. The red line represents the tax levy changes, and we have been uh, very conscious of living within the tax cap. For example, last year you see that our tax cap was um, a little bit over 1.5%. We raised the tax levy 1.5%. This year, because of the resources and the expenditure work that we've done, we're proposing a 0% tax increase. The green line has been added to show what has happened with foundation aid. The story that we've been complaining about or talking about over the last few years is look at how the green line was going down, going down, going down. In fact, uh, two years ago, we were in the lowest tier of districts in terms of the amount of state aid we received. And this year, we, we did not get an increase over last year. We were frozen at last year's level. Now it's gone up 6.12%. So we've used those resources to be able to offer the community a 0% tax increase in combination with our expense reductions. So key votes, 
we are voting on the budget, which is 103.5 million. We have a separate proposi proposition to use monies that have been legally set aside by the board and approved by the community for the replacement of our bus fleet. And we have four open board of education seats. Uh, and we're hoping that um, we will have four candidates for the four seats. The budget vote occurs on May 18th. If the budget passes, uh, we'll move into planning for next year. We all also have the option to rework the budget and to submit the budget for a second vote or to adopt a contingency budget. We're hoping that the community will come out to vote this year. We had a really great turnout last year through the voting, uh, the, uh, the written ballots and the Mallon voting. This year will be in person uh, unless someone requests uh, an absentee ballot through an application process and the state has added to the uh, criteria uh, which uh, would make a, a registered voter eligible for an absentee ballot, uh, COVID related concerns. So uh, people can vote by uh, in person and people under certain, um, meet certain criteria can vote through the absentee ballot. A few days from now, April 19th, uh, is the uh, last day for board candidates to uh, turn in their packets for uh, running for the board. Uh, on April 20th, we will draw for ballot positions. Uh, that is done uh, by the clerk, and it is uh, the order in which names will appear, uh, actually appear on the ballot. We have a public hearing uh, virtually from the Columbia High School on May 5th. If we have more candidates than uh, slots, we will have a meet the candidates night and our budget vote is on the 18th. We also have several meetings that are scheduled and the board has received that schedule to meet with uh, parents and all of our schools, community members, and we do have a scheduled presentation to the East Greenbush uh, Town Board. So with that, that concludes our presentation. We hope that the community will come out and support the budget and we feel that the budget will put our district in good shape for next year. And I'll take any questions or concerns at this time that the board may have. Again, I want to thank Mrs. Wagger for all her work. <laughs> so we'll just wait for the presentation to come down so the board members can, we can see them and ask any questions. But um, while we're waiting for that, any questions or comments from the board members here in the room this evening, Frank? Kathleen, John, Frank, uh, go ahead, John. Just a quick comment. Um, wanted to uh, thank Linda for putting together a budget that is easy to read and really comprehensive at the same time. Um, I wanted to note that when I was reading and going over the material, the fact that we're still looking at reductions is, is a really good thing. And I appreciate the diligence uh, for that, I think it's really important to the community to understand that um, even though we're getting these aids, that we still have to be mindful of the the money that we're spending it and the, the way we're spending it and trying to be as efficient as possible while providing service. The second comment I have is when we're talking about the COVID-related expenses from the federal government, um, I like the way that you frame that because I think it's important for us to sit back and take a hard look, look at our data, and really try to fill in the gaps with this money. There's gonna be some substantial educational gaps for our kids. And I think that when we move forward to develop the programming, um, hopefully it won't be a long term that we can provide the resources necessary for all students. And I think that um, when we move forward with this, targeting things that really have a broad reaching effect for everyone because um, looking at the way this thing is shaking out it's not just you know kids with certain needs it's it's all kids are going to have a deficit in regards to this and i think when we spend that money we try to be as as broad and in the application as we can and being very specific mm -hmm. at the same time so mm -hmm. th thank you for 
the opportunity. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Kathleen? I want to say thank you for the budget. I don't think I've ever smiled that much during a present <laughs> a budget presentation. Um, I'm very happy to see the advocacy has paid off and the state has kind of stepped up and really helped us when we need it, and so has the federal government. So um, I agree with John that you know we have a lot, a lot of work still to be done, and thank you for putting so much effort into finding the places right now that we really need the money and putting the resources where they're needed. It's a great, great budget. I am very happy. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Mark or Joanne? Jen, Michelle, comments? Thumbs up, thumbs up. All right. Um, just uh, I'll make one final comment before we move on. Um, again, appreciate the work uh, that the uh, Jeff, the administration, Linda did with the budget. Um, I think that it shows that the board and the district has been very strategic over the years to make sure that our um, and conservative to help the district to plan over time and utilize reserves that we put aside over time strategically, like you said, and also to um, continue to make sure that we have the funding long term. And that's really the critical piece is that this is, you know, we, we'd love to see this sustained, as you can see from the graph about the, the, the three points there. Um, the foundation out is pretty, you know, how the state really tried to shift a lot of the, the to the local taxpayer from previous support that they had and which was very difficult over time and, and resulted in a lot of tough decisions for districts. But I think that as we continue to look through what our needs are over the course of the next two, two to five years, we can then plan out and make sure that we are meeting the needs as John said and that we can continue to provide the programming for our students that our parents expect and to make this, continue to make this a very attractive district to move into, um, continue the growth that we've we've seen when other districts are flat or declining, and maintain the programs and even improve the programs that we've provided to our, our students and opportunities for our staff to to teach and, and, and learn and be, uh, through professional development. So I'm very pleased about the budget. Um, it is obviously a, you know, a, a large budget, and we're a large district, but we provide a lot of services and opportunities for children and our families, and I think the community will, and I hope they do come out and support uh, the budget, so. Thank you, Mike. Okay. All right. If there's no final comments, um, we'll move to the uh, next part of our agenda. Uh, discussion items, I don't have anything. Board members, do you have anything? No? Okay. Moving on to committee reports, we'll start with uh, Marissa. Our Appendix D committee met on Tuesday, March 23rd. We began our meeting with looking at the differences between Science Olympiad um, head coach, assistant coach, and tech coach advisor. Allison Hosier provided a great background, a comprehensive overview um, for the committee to review, and we now have a better understanding how each of those responsibilities are delegated within the team. We provided an overview of the AV director position at Goff with the help of uh, Mrs. Barker. And then Mr. McHugh, Mrs. Taylor, and myself uh, worked to complete a draft spreadsheet with the remainder of the clubs tiered. And we presented um, to our EGTA committee members um, for the review and feedback. We were looking to seek Scott Holliday's advice on the music stipends, and it was agreed at this committee meeting that we would invite him to a future committee meeting held in April to talk to us a little bit about what the advisors are responsible for and what those outside obligations look like. We had a long discussion regarding Ski Club and some of the responsibilities as it pertains to that club advisor's responsibilities on the bus and also on the mountain and Drew um, had agreed to reach out to the advisor to get the committee a little bit more information about that specific club. We scheduled four additional meeting dates. Um, we have dates that we're going to be meeting weekly through April of 2021. We actually had a meeting today and we are about 95% done <laughs> with the tiers. So 
Um, we have made a lot of good progress. Nice. We only have three um, club stipends right now that we are looking further into. And hopefully we will have consensus at our next meeting on April 20th. And we will be looking to assign compensation to those tiers. Um, and so we have tiers one through five. Once we have assigned the compensation, we will ensure that it's within the budget parameters and we will have something to present to um, Mr. Simons. I want to thank the committee, Marissa and Jim, for your leadership and working with the uh, the Penn State Committee. So thank you. Good good to hear the progress that you've made. Any questions for, for Marissa? No? Very good. Move on to Linda. I have no committee. Great no committee, and you've, you've been doing yeoman's work trying to get the uh, budget going, so I appreciate that. I should say your woman's work, right? Mr. McHugh, Jim? Yeah, just a brief update in regards to the New York State testing program. Uh, the grades 3 through 8 ELA testing will uh, take place next week. On Monday, April 19th, our A-day students in grades 3 through 8 will take the ELA assessment. On Tuesday, April 20th, our B-day students We'll take the ELA assessment and uh, communication went home to all of our remote families, inviting them in and giving them the opportunity for their child to be tested. It is required that students take that assessment in person. Uh, we have right now 48 full remote students that are coming in on Wednesday, uh, April 21st to take the ELA assessment. So a good response and uh, principals have done a great job preparing and we're ready to go next week. And I think that's important to note because I think that the data that we gather from the information from those assessments is so critical for us as we plan and design our instruction for the future and, and, and meeting where those gaps might be, especially this year and in future years. So, so thank you for that. Any questions for Jim? No? Okay. Jeff? We had a safety committee meeting on March 29th. Uh, we had several topics that we discussed. We, we've... This year we've established a practice at our meetings of just getting some feedback from various uh, schools and employees regarding how the health and safety protocols are going regarding COVID-19, such as the temperature checks and the um, screening for symptoms and the return to school protocols. By all reports, uh, those safety measures are going very, very well and very smoothly. We've had a report from both Sergeant Kondo and Sheriff Deputy Sheriff Russo regarding the activities of our school resource officers who continue to engage in um, educational and intervention activities to help our students and our families. Our nurse coordinator, Tammy Cosgrove, gave a report on some of the activities that are occurring with our nurses. We shared the results of the school climate survey that was done earlier this year that looks at indicators of positive school climate. Uh, we have a subcommittee of that committee that looked at those survey results. I plan to present that information to the board in May formally so the community can see that overall our parents, our employees, and our students at the fifth grade through 12th grade level really feel strongly that and agree with the fact that our school offers a very accepting, welcoming, and safe environment for everybody. We have prioritized some areas that we feel further growth could occur, uh, areas such as uh, intervention of mental health at the middle school level, in particular, jumped out at us as still positive, but an area that needs some improvement. Uh, bullying is a growing concern, not only in East Greenbush, but in all districts, particularly with online mm -hmm. activities. So while well, overall the stakeholders indicated that they didn't feel it was, uh, they didn't think it was an excessive problem, that they thought that there was more work that we could do to focus on bullying. And certainly our resource officers and others have stepped up to intervene to address those issues. And we want to do a better job of um, making sure that all of our staff that may not be as active in some of our district committees uh, recognize how the district goes about evaluating the success of programs uh, or the, the programs that may need 
need, need change. So those were kind of three areas that jumped out at us that we'll give you more data on. But overall, particularly that we implemented this climate survey during the COVID-19, I was very pleased with the uh, response of our staff, our parents, and our students. Uh, additionally, uh, Mr. Mann, our board vice president, and Mark is out there, if he wants to add anything more, uh, he participated in a meeting uh, with law enforcement as well as um, representatives from companies that provide the uh, bus stop cameras. Uh, we know that there is a concern about um, people violating the law and passing our school buses. There's, uh, there was a meeting held about how the program worked, and then there's further efforts that are being made to bring this forward to county representatives because a county uh, a law would be required in order to really implement it. I'll ask Mr. Mann if he, I know he's out there, if he wants to add anything. He, I was not at that meeting, but Mr. Mann was, and he facilitated the discussion at the safety committee. So Mark, if you have anything to add, feel free. Thanks, Jeff. Um, no, nothing, just waiting for the county to get back to me on dates um, so that the bus company can make their presentation to the county officials. I just talked to one yesterday and the three that are actually uh, pushing behind it um, are trying to all coordinate when they can get together today. I don't know if anybody's seen in the news, but Albany County Legislature passed their county law um yesterday yep. so um once the Rancho county folks seen that you know they're like okay you know we we got to get moving as well so it's moving um hopefully we'll be able to set up another meeting with the bus patrol company uh here in the next week or so thank you mark one other item we talked about it wasn't formally on our agenda but we asked sam beersley to give a report sam beersley is with Questar health and safety and risk management uh, Questar is conducting our lead testing, which is required by New York State law. And we're almost finished with that uh, process. We, where we have found higher uh, levels of lead within the water, there's an actionable level of 15 parts per billion. That doesn't mean if one time somebody drank water out of that faucet, it was a problem. We didn't really find any water fountains where the that were in use that tested high, but we did find sinks in some of the schools, uh, bathrooms, and some of the kitchen areas where the testing indicated that remedial action was required. When that happens, we put signs on the on the faucet locations that it's not drinkable water, uh, and we retest, we flush. We retest, and in some cases, we have to fi replace fixtures, faucets, and in some cases, going going back into the, the piping. A lot of work was done already through the capital project uh, to do the more expensive stuff that would be required of this. We are required by law that within a certain period of time, I think it's 10 days of the results to put that out in the public. We've been putting it out in the public, and we've only received one question and concern from one parent right now and we we've responded to it Excellent. so that, that we are in compliance and we are following the regulations regarding lead testing of our water excellent thank you any additional questions for mr simons no i want to thank uh, mark i think it was a couple of years ago one of the school boards wasn't it when we saw the cameras on the buses and the that idea and just bringing that that idea full circle and and working with our local community and law enforcement and, and safety folks to kind of get that to fruition and seeing those things happen, but we can get, make that work. So appreciate your work on that, Mark. Moving to the next part of the agenda is the minutes. Um, all members were present except for Mr. Dunn. Any revisions to the minutes? No, seeing none, I need a motion to approve the minutes. Kathleen, second. Deanna, all those in favor? All those abstaining? One approved. Moving on to regular business is the adoption of the proposed budget. We've had conversations um, about the budget, so I need a motion to move the budget forward. Joanne, second. John, all those in favor? We will move it forward. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you to the board. Thank you, Jeff and Linda. Approval of programs for resident children with disabilities. Any questions or comments? Need a motion to approve that? Deanna, second. Frank, all those in favor? Approved. Approval of the East Greenwood Central School District Public Health Emergency Continuation of Operations Plan. Do you have any comments on that? This is a requirement of the state that came into place this year that school districts are required to have uh, <clears throat> public emergency plans for uh, public health issues, such as COVID-19. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, we worked with Questar Boses on a template uh, that they provided for us, and we revised it based on our own needs. Um, okay. Marissa Cannon, Jeff Tooker, uh, Sam Beardsley, uh, myself, um, and took a look at it. We were required by the regulation to share it with our bargaining units. We did. We did not receive any feedback from any groups with exception of SRP. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no specific concerns about the plan, but I just wanted to make sure that as we, um, as we, if we were to implement any such plan, that uh, no provisions would be in conflict with any bargaining unit sure. contract provision. Sure. That was the only general concern, and we assured them that that wouldn't be the case. Great. So um, it's really a boilerplate document that's required by law that can be fine-tuned to the specific situation the district. Okay. that we may encounter. I did miss the April 1st deadline. I apologize for that. We posted it on our website, but mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get it up on the board agenda for March 24th, so that was on me. But we asked the board to approve it this evening. Very good. Any questions or comments regarding the uh, what's known as the COOP plan for a public health emergency? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve that. Mark, second, Jennifer, all those in favor? Approved. Moving on to spring higher risk sports, it looks like boys lacrosse is the only one designated as such? That is correct. Okay. I see Mr. Leonard is present. Any comments, Mike? Nope. I'm very excited to get spring sports going. Very good. <laughs> no, you're working hard. Thank you. The team, the coaches. Um, any questions or comments on the spring sports for lacrosse? Seeing none, any motion to approve that? Kathleen, second. Frank, all those in favor? Approved. Thank you. You're welcome, Michael. Good luck to the lacrosse team. I was a question, why is girls lacrosse not on high risk sport, but boys lacrosse is? Because boys lacrosse is a little bit more high contact sports. The high girls contact. have more of a safety zone around yeah. them. Um, so the girls shouldn't be coming in as close contact. That's the re main reason <laughs> they why. They might argue otherwise, right, Mike? Uh, uh, yeah, but. <laughs> All right, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Reports and presentations, superintendent. Um, Proposed change in policy first reading, Mr. Simons? This policy was spoken about at the last board meeting yep. as a report out on our policy committee. Uh, it is a requirement of federal and state uh, law to have a revised policy on school district officers and employee code of ethics. This applies to ensuring that there are no conflicts of interest related to a administrator or a board member mm -hmm. related to the, the awarding of a federal grant and that is the only change and it, the language has been recommended by the school boards association the policy committee met and discussed this and indicated no concerns okay very good any questions or comments on the policy revision okay do we need a motion to go to second reading we just want to just move it just that's okay um, just, we'll wait till second reading and next board meeting yeah i think so I think so yeah. okay if you do have any comments for Mr. Simons or the policy committee, just let uh, let them know. And then if there's any changes to that, it is a recommended policy by school boards. Um, seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, table motions. Um, none at this time. Old business. I don't have anything. Board members, anything? No? Okay. Moving on to our consent agenda. We have items A through L. Any comments or questions on the consent agenda? Mike, I'd like to pull um, item B for a separate vote, please. My husband's listed as one of the coaches. Very good. Item B. 
Thank you. Will be polled. Anyone else? Questions, comments? I don't see anyone. So um, I just want to make one comment. I want to thank uh, Stewarts again for their support of gifts to our district. Very substantial financial support. Again, I want to thank the uh, the Stewarts for the Green Meadow and Red Mill uh, donations. So very much appreciated. With that, uh, we need a motion to approve by consent items A through L with the exception of item B. We have a motion for that. Kathleen, second. Joanne, all those in favor? Approved. Moving on to item B. I need a motion to approve item B. John, second. Michelle, all those in favor? All those abstaining? Joanne, one. Okay, very good. Approved. New business, board members, anything? Okay. Public forum number two, as we have gone through quite a bit of information with our reopening guidance information and the budget. Linda, do we have any comments from the public? We do have one comment, one, comment. Um, yeah. one question. question. This is from Anne Marie Bailey. Uh, Ms. Bailey is says, hello, I have two children, kindergarten and first grade, currently attending Belltop. First, I would like to thank Mr. Simons and the board for your continued efforts to get the children back to school full time. Regarding the new regulations, do you anticipate that they will carry through to the 2021-2022 school year? For example, kindergarten through at least fifth in school full time. I believe unless the COVID-19 situation gets bad and it's not likely to because of the vaccinations and the we're seeing a, an opening up in a number of different areas i don't if i were a betting man or a predictor i don't believe that that will happen okay um the regulations as they stand right now the document that i talked about earlier um i think what's happening is districts don't know whether the Department of Health or whether the Department of Education will issue anything different between now and September. So we're planning on utilizing these regulations to plan scenarios for September. Um, we are in a situation right now where we have made the adjustments, at least at the K-5 level, to have the kids attend in person five days a week. Okay, uh, kindergarten was brought in several weeks ago, first grade and now second grade is in as of uh, Tuesday. So, and three, four and five will be in um, uh, on the 26th. So I don't anticipate that changing. I do think that we may still need to offer a full remote option for those families that uh, need it, but I don't. I don't see at the K five level us moving backwards, so to speak. I do hope that the regulations will be reviewed, and that they will enable us to simply open up K twelve with the three feet social distancing requirement without any caveats. Mm. Okay, that's what I would hope for and uh, advocate for. I don't. I be, if I can be just fully fully transparent, I don't believe that the cohorting requirement in and of itself without the other mitigation and layered strategies that are required by the health department is really going to do anything more than what is already being done by everything else that we're doing. Okay? Students are not cohorting when they're outside of school. They're running in the neighborhood. They're go going together with social activities. They're not cohorting. <laughs> they are wearing masks in some circumstances, being socially distanced in some circumstances when, when they can or when supervised. And so I don't see the cohorting requirement as um, necessary, to be honest about it, at the middle school and the high school level. I think the other things that we're doing uh, in combination with the vaccinations now being available for uh, 16 and 17 year olds 
and any adult who wants it, uh, along with the hand hand washing and having hand sanitizer and masks and uh, good sanitation and disinfecting procedures on buses and the schools. I think all those things are working well. We haven't cohorted the middle school and the high school since September. We've had not one, not one case of infection spread among our middle school and our high school students in school. That is why I don't think the cohorting is really a necessary constraint on our district right now. Mm. But I don't anticipate the K-5 level changing. If anything, we might be in a situation where some of the modifications that we've had to make to how instruction is delivered would be a little loosened a little bit. For example, using two rooms for one grade level. Makes sense. Anything else, Linda? Thank you, Mr. Simons. There are no other public comments. Very good. Thank you. Moving on to the uh, second board form, I'll start um, in the room here. On my left, I'll start with John. Anything? Yeah, very good. Deanna? Very good. Frank? All set. Kathleen? All set. Um, on the screen, uh, Jennifer? Very good. Michelle? Good. Mark? Good. Thumbs up. Joanne? Just one quick um, announcement. I apologize for my lateness today. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that the East Greenbush Education Foundation is holding its virtual gala this Friday night um, at 7 o'clock. We will be um, inducting Brigadier General Kim Colleton from the class of 87, Jesse Pavlik from the class of 2007, and Bobby Reno from the class of 68. Also, we will be um, giving the community member award to Mr. Wayne Pratt, who has put many, many hours of volunteerism into the district, um, primarily with the BRAC committee, but always helping us with the budget. Um, it is on the district website, the link. Um, it's on the Education Foundation website and Facebook page. So it's 7 o'clock um, on a YouTube link, and we encourage you to join us. Thank you, Joanne. I just have uh, two, two quick ones. Um, I want to thank the administrators. We have the, the uh, agreement was, was rat um, ratified, right? and the board approved it tonight, so I want to thank the work that was done on the, the contract. I'd like to hear maybe next meeting, graduation. Some preliminary ideas around that. Very so um, I see a lot of smiles, but uh, I'd love to, things did come out recently about graduation and large events, proms, things like that. And I think uh, we need to take advantage of the space that we have. And really, I know you guys are working hard on, on what that graduation is gonna look like. I think it has to be very, very special for our seniors this year. And I'd love to see something excellent, awesome, so. All right. We, we did we did send the new regulation to Mr. Harkin, the administrators at the high school, and okay. the senior class advisors. Okay. And I know they're working on some ideas yeah. and some options for venues. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So we'll hear more about that in the future. With that, we do have need for an executive session um, for purpose of personnel matters. Correct. Uh, we don't anticipate any uh, business transacting after the executive session so with that i need a motion to approve a move to executive session kathleen any a second jennifer all is in favor so approved so we uh, peter needs five minutes to set the link up to the board members and i want to thank everyone for their uh, participation tonight a lot of good information was shared and i'm very pleased about the uh, the guidance and also the budget so have a great night everyone and uh well the next meeting is tuesday because it's the uh, the twentieth, is what it is. Yeah. Yes. Right. So just keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone.